I don't know who you are or where we are, but I've just walked in the back door and they said, here, you take this microphone and talk. <laughs> so I'll claim to be John Racanelli, the CEO of the National Aquarium. It is a real pleasure to welcome you all here tonight to our Marjorie Lynn Bank lecture series, which is made possible by the generous support of the Bank family and their, uh, and, and their wonderful daughter, Marjorie, who was a diver who died before her time, but was a photographer and a true lover of the ocean. And it's in that spirit that we have uh, instituted this program many years ago and are so excited to uh, start up again this year for 2018. Um, our series this year is focusing on change makers. And I think we started on the right note. This is about individuals who have devoted themselves to creating positive change be it to address climate change and resiliency, improving ocean and human health, um, and or building more inclusive, equitable, just spaces for people and ensuring people have an opportunity to access and experience nature. Currently, voices of color are frankly quite underrepresented in the conservation movement. I think that's probably no secret to many of the folks in the room here. And we believe it's important to provide the space for a dedicated conversation about conservation and diversity um, and how to achieve a future where there is more equitable representation and equal access. And I think we can, all institutions, organizations like ourselves can do more. Um, one example I think is the Green 2.0 Initiative, which was previously called the Green Diversity Initiative, authored the most comprehensive report on diversity uh, in the history of the environmental movement. And what it indicated was that people of color made up approximately 15% of staff across foundations, NGOs, and government agencies. 15%. That is not anywhere near equal to the representation of people of color in the, in the population, obviously. Or consider visitation to national parks. In 2011, which is the last year for which data is available, which is part of the problem, a survey found of, of visitors found that about 22% of visitors were people of color, and they make up 37% of our U.S. population. So there's work to do, and these issues really hit home for us here at the Aquarium. Our vision is to change the way humanity cares for our ocean planet. And it can't be fulfilled if we're not connecting with all of humankind. It's, it's just pretty much self-evident. Self more than half the students we reach here at the National Aquarium with our conservation education programs are from underrepresented communities. Uh, we engage them through thoughtfully designed programs like What Lives in the Harbor, which brings Baltimore City Middle School students to our campus now to study water quality. Um, with the South Baltimore Community Engagement and Environmental Stewardship Program, we collaborate with the Latino community in Brooklyn and Curtis Bay to overcome environmental injustices that have plagued those neighborhoods for decades. And then in addition to our work in neighborhoods across the city, the aquarium is committed to providing locals with opportunities to visit for free or reduced admission in those communities that are both underrepresented and also are disadvantaged. And so our Read to Reef book club, par book club partnership with the Enoch Pratt Free Library System has been a fabulous way for young people to win their visit to the aquarium by virtue of their uh, success as a reader. It's just a, it's a triple bottom line win. So this month, in honor of Black History Month, um, with the support of our community partners, many of whom are in the room here, we're hosting this evening to shine a light on the work being done to create a just and fair future. A future where all people can access the physical, mental, and spiritual benefits of nature. That is a mission worth fulfilling. I want to start by thanking our community partners for joining us this evening. So we got black girls. In fact, let's hear it for each of you. Black girls dive. <laughs> Hispanic Access Foundation. <laughs> Morgan State University's Patuxent Environmental Aquatic Research Laboratory, Pearl. <laughs> Pearl. Uh, Patterson Park Audubon Center, my hood and Maryland DNR's Esmi Parque. <laughs> well, most importantly, though, I want to I want to uh, thank uh, the person who's going to speak to you in a few moments, our featured speaker, who is a true trailblazer, and she's going to share her story with us. Let me give you a little bit more information about Dr. Mamie Parker. 
who I was only lucky enough to meet tonight, but have heard about for a long time and discovered, of course, we have many mutual friends. Um, former Assistant Director of Fisheries and Habitat Conservation at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She made history when she was appointed the first African American Regional Director of the 13 Northeastern states. She's the recipient of numerous awards, including the Presidential Rank Award, the highest honor awarded to government employees, as well as the American Fisheries Society Emmeline Moore Award. And she was also inducted into the Arkansas Outdoor Hall of Fame for her accomplishments. And Arkansas, of course, is her home state. Dr. Parker founded and now runs M.A. Parker and Associates, helping other organizations achieve their vision and stay positive about the future. What an important mission that is, to stay positive about the future. She's a current board member, a current board member of Brown Advisory and the Chesapeake Conservancy, and she's also served on the boards of directors of the National Wildlife Refuge Association and Defenders of Wildlife. Dr. Parker was awarded a doctoral degree in limnology, which is I'm sure you all know the study of lakes and inland waters from University of Mich uh, Wisconsin. Sorry, I almost made a terrible mistake there. Those people across the lake, oh my god. <laughs> my wife's from Michigan. And as Dr. Parker shares her story, we encourage you to jot down any questions you might have on the blank index cards that you got as you came in. We're going to collect those, and at the end of her talk, uh, we'll do a Q&A session. Good evening. Now, you can do better than that. I'm an African-American Creole Cajun that happens to be the granddaughter of a minister. And in my culture, when we call, we ask you to respond. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. And while you're doing that, I'm going to ask Curtis to grab me that pointer right there <laughs> so I can have a speech. I am so excited to be here. And first of all, I'd like to say uh, I have been called many things, some of which, thank you, darling, some of which I can repeat, others I can't, but the celebration queen is the one that I'm most proud of. So I'd like to celebrate the CEO of this wonderful organization, along with Maggie and others that have invited me here today. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you very much. Maggie and Curtis have done a wonderful job of inviting us here. I have been fortunate to have Camille Jefferson, and she's in the audience, and she is one of those ladies that will come with me wherever I go. And I'm getting emotional as I think about what sisterhood is all about. She is going to leave here tonight, and we're driving to State College, Pennsylvania, for a speech tomorrow morning. And so I'd like to say thank you very much for always being there for me. <laughs> so, as I think about what I want to talk about, I'll ask you to take a deep breath, breathe in that good air, but I want you to close your eyes and I'd like for you to go back to 60 years ago, 1957, in this small town in Arkansas. This mother, the single mother at the time, she had already had five boys and five girls. And if you can imagine with your eyes closed that her husband had left her two years earlier and she had met the man that was the one that would allow her to farm his land and they had had an affair. And it was October of that year and she was a about to decide, she had decided that she was going to keep a baby that she had had by him. And he had another family on the other side of town. And she decided that she was going to keep that little girl. But more importantly, or boy, she wasn't sure. But more importantly, she said, I'm going to take that child fishing with me. If you'll open your eyes now, that child was me. It was October 1957. About a month before that, my mother had really been impressed with Eisenhower. In the small town of Arkansas, in the big town of Little Rock, Eisenhower had sent troops into Little Rock to escort nine little girls and boys into Central High School to 
integrate that school. And it wasn't easy because the governor, yes, the governor <laughs> had said that he felt that it was just not the right thing to do for boys and girls of color to join others in that school because it would just create so much chaotic turmoil that it would just be hard for the community to overcome that. But those girls and boys, they had courage. They were inspired. Just like the boys and girls that I've seen over the last week from Florida that have stepped out there. <laughs> And they've said, we've got to do something about what's going on in our world and help us to do that. My mother was so impressed with the president at the time that she gave me the first lady's name. I was born on his birthday, but I'm glad mama didn't name me Ike. <laughs> <laughs> but she did name me Mamie, and Mamie was the first lady of the country at the time. And then she did take me fishing. And it was on the banks of Bayou Bartholomew in southern Arkansas and Louisiana that I got my start. And so I was asked tonight to tell my story. And sometimes it's kind of hard to do that because there are so many other things that I want to talk about other than myself. But I'll just start by saying this subject, diversity and equity and inclusiveness as well as justice, is certainly something that we all need to have a conversation about this subject is not easy. We need strategies that are safe to talk about. We need great lessons learned. We need mentors to help girls like Nicole Williams, who's out there in the audience. She's looking for a job, so hold up your hand, Nicole. Job time. <laughs> Upward mobility. We need change in the demographics, as you've heard here tonight from our CEO. We need women that are in the struggle, in the environmental field, to find the survival modes that they need. All of us need to find that transformational change, but we have to believe in our own power that we can do this. Even though, just like this aquarium is a pioneer in ocean conservation, we as pioneers have to be bold, we have to take risks, we have to trust our guts, we have to exceed our expectations, we have to express gratitude, and we have to lead by example. You here tonight, I wanna celebrate you all for being here because I know it's not always easy to come out at night to do this, but in your communities, in many cases, I've met some of you. I've met a wonderful young lady from Howard County that's doing great things with curriculum in her school. They are leading by example, and we're proud of them. Connecting communities of color with nature. And we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. One of my favorite sayings, if the shoe fits, buy it in every color. <laughs> So if there are wonderful things going on, we need to figure out, look at those non-traditional partners that are out there doing great things. In the environmental justice field, Ben Wilson in the Washington, D.C. area, working with the National Law Association, telling them about environmental justice. Dudley Edmondson, one of my favorite photographers, doing wonderful things, showcasing people of color in the outdoors. We need to look at the sports. We need to look at health because that's certainly a connection. We need to look at our faith-based communities to see. And I'm proud to be on the board of Brown Advisory that right down the road there. And when I talk about leading by example, Mike Hankins, when he put me on his board, I thought I'd just be there and sit there quietly. And I was so happy to be there and sit there quietly and get paid to sit there. But he, made sure that most meetings at first that I had the chance to sit by him and he talked about my presence and what it meant to be a pioneer on that board. And so our leaders in the communities is some of those nonverbals that are just as important as the verbal things. It's all about walking the talk. It's all about knowing that it's important. It's all about doing what they're doing at Ben Franklin High School. And I had the privilege of going over there and doing their commencement ceremony and hearing the great partnerships that they have in the community. It's about what you all are doing right here in the Chesapeake 
diversity work groups. I read all of the time the great connections that you're making in the community. Having served on the board of the Chesapeake Conservancy and doing the Mar Parker journey in 12 high schools here in the Baltimore community, and that was very difficult for me. And I told Camille, why can't we go to some schools where they don't take my purse and escort me in? And Camille said, girl, come on. She said, nobody wants to go to these schools. You will go and you'll do a wonderful job. And so I'm so grateful that we realize that it is the K through 12 kids that we have to touch first when we talk about conservation careers in academia. It's important for us to know that our internships are important, but it's so important for us to get money for some of the things that, in many cases, other kids don't even think about. They don't have money uh, many times to even for the transportation to get to many of the sites just to do their jobs. It's little things because when we finally get jobs, many of our parents and many of the people in our community, they need our money to help pay the light bill in some cases. They need us. I had to send money home quite often to help my sisters and family members. But we have to get over that fear and realize that we too can do this, that we, it's worth it. And it's something that we gotta do. We need to find those resources to help people and encourage people and let them know it's our land, it's our heritage, and it's our legacy. And so tonight, I'm gonna spend about 10 more minutes telling you about my life story, and then we'll sit down and have a rap session. Is that okay? You guys ready for the ride? Here we go. So Nature for All is all about what I call radical collaboration. It's not just collaboration, but it's radical collaboration. It's about doing the hard work. And it's not always going to be easy, but it's the hard work. Avoiding what Dr. Steve Covey talks about when he talks about the four cancers of life. And then finally, keep going and growing. And that's important. I mentioned Miss Piggy Parker. That's a picture of her there. That's my mother. All that I am and I hope to be, I owe it to my mother. She introduced me to Mother Earth. My first opportunity to get out there. This is the house that I was born in, in this cotton field. Never saw a hospital in my life. It was here that my brothers and sisters and I worked this land. And we had protein in our diet that came from the wild game and the fish that we caught in the streams there. But my mother taught me life lessons on the banks of Bayou Bartholomew and Lake Enterprise. And she said something I'd heard Flip Wilson one night on TV, and I repeated him. He said, what you see is what you, yeah. you guys are as old as I am. <laughs> he said, what you see is what you get. And that was amazing to me because I said that to my mother, and she said to me, Mamie, in life, if you want to catch that big fish, you got to visualize that fish at the end of that pole. You got to see it to achieve it. You got to believe it sowing those seeds. That picture there is now is what I see when I look at that young man there. He is my great, great nephew. I see him going fishing, and not for the first time and the only time, but taking other people fishing with him. And hopefully you can see that too. Lake Enterprise, Bayou Bartholomew, right here. The power of nature. And the reason I call it that is because 75% of the girls in my ninth grade class, unfortunately, at the time, it may be okay now, but they were pregnant in the ninth grade. And one of the reasons that I got lucky was because I was out fishing right there in Lake Enterprise. And so now I tell everybody, had I not been fishing, I would have been kissing. <laughs> The power of nature will help a lot of young men and women, a lot of young men and women stay ahead. My mother taught me all that she knew with an eighth grade education, but there was a sense of shame there for me because again, my father, he never owned me. In fact, one time he gave me a piece of juicy fruit gum, and when he gave me that gum, I was about five, six years old. He said, don't tell anybody I gave you this gum. 
Well, at that age, and with 10 other brothers and sisters, of course, I was chewing the gum, and they asked, where did I get it from? And I said, that man. And they went over and asked him for gum. And he told me then, he said, you broke my trust. I gave you that gum to test you. And he said, I've always been embarrassed that you came into this world. And that was a gift. And sometimes we get gifts in different ways. And that's what we have to think about when we think about nature for all. We're going to see gifts that are not, they don't always look the same. That was a gift for me because he encouraged me without even knowing it to work hard to make sure that most people were not embarrassed by me. It was that high school teacher, though, that came along. And what my mother didn't teach me, he taught me. But he also introduced our class to this song. And this song was by Marvin Gaye, and it was Mercy, Mercy Me. And that song talked about what's going on. And he, it talked about what was going on, the, the radiation. It talked about the mercury in our fish. When I heard that, I said, mercury in our fish? What you talking about, Willis? I stopped and realized that this was the fish that I was eating from the farmland and from the pesticides in the community that I lived in. He inspired me to want to do more and be more. And that's what we have to do is to inspire others to do that. That high school teacher encouraged me to go on to the University of Arkansas. And quite frankly, when it was time for me to select my major, I had a choice between civics, political science, and biology. I'd like to think I chose biology because I was smart and wanted to do something related to fisheries, but that wasn't it. I had a crush on that teacher, and I wanted to impress him. <laughs> <laughs> so I majored in <laughs> biology, and then I found out because a guy came from the U U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and he sold me on the Fish and Wildlife Service. We have to be ambassadors, as you are, many of you out there, selling people on the importance of nature for all. He encouraged me and told me we are all sometimes stuck, stalled, and scared. But he talked about an internship and a job at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And it was... Scared I was, but I remembered the words of my mother when she talked about fear. And I was afraid a lot of times when I went fishing with her because my other brothers and sisters told me snakes were there and I should be afraid. But she said fear was false evidence, most of the time appearing real, F-E-A-R, and that we had to overcome those. And so I took the opportunity to join the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as an intern and moved up to Wisconsin for my first job as an intern with all intentions of going back south. My next job when I graduated was in Green Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> when we talk about nature for all and engaging others in the movement, sometimes we have to go up to get back down. That was not my intentions to go to Green Bay. But I stayed there for a number of years, and then I wanted to go south. My next job was in Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes in life, you all have some wonderful plans. You have some wonderful things that you're doing. Sometimes we get frustrated because they all don't happen at once. But what we need to remember is that small steps, they do count. They make a difference. Madison is 121 miles south of Green Bay. <laughs> Stayed there in Madison for a number of years working at, in a wonderful uh, national fish hatchery, and then I went over to the National um, Wildlife Laboratory where I had a chance to work on the bald eagle and some work there. But I wanted to go south. My next job was in Columbia, Missouri. And it was here in Columbia that I had a chance to work with farmers, helping them to grow wildlife on their lands. They didn't have a good impression or appreciation for federal government employees and would often tell me that in many words. And in fact, it was one day I was in a barn with about 50 of them and they quite frankly said, 
you are worried about an endangered bat. We are trying to raise beans to feed our babies. And they said to me, you are a woman and you should be at home having babies. Yes, I went the same way the first time. My response was that. But then I realized that we have to figure out how to reach out and touch people and make people feel comfortable. And so then I had to use all that I had. Sometimes we have to leap and grow our wings on our way down. It was here that I realized the human would probably work with them. So I reached down and figured out a way to connect with them. And that's what we need to do when we talk about nature for all, ways in which we can connect with people, relate to them. I grabbed the soil in my hand, shared with them that I too had worked on a farm, and I knew what it meant to live off the land and to eat the beans on that farm. But the other thing I did, when I reached down to grab it, my wig fell off. <laughs> I got up laughing. They laughed too. Humor sometimes makes a difference makes people feel better. And that seemed to have worked at that time. That job was really great, but I wanted to go south. My next job was in Minneapolis, Minnesota, <laughs> working in the Great Lakes. It was a wonderful experience. Again, sometimes we fall down, but we get up. We fall down, but we get up for winners or losers that fall down, but get back up again and again and again. The job in Minnesota was not one that I had chosen. It was one that was chosen for me. But I learned this from one of my favorite guys, Colonel Colin, I mean, uh, General Colin Powell. They say he lives in my neighborhood somewhere in Northern Virginia. I've been going to garage sales looking for him. <laughs> I haven't found him yet, but General Powell has some wonderful things in his Powell's principles. And those things, they work so well when we talk about connecting kids to nature, when we talk about nature for all. Because sometimes we're going to get frustrated, but what he says is get mad and get over it. Get mad and get over it. Look at your neighbor now and tell him, get mad and get over it. <laughs> Challenging. We need... We need to do this simply because we have all of these things that are going on in life and in our community that we need. And I see some as challenges. I see some as opportunities. Changing demographics does not have to be a challenge. It can certainly be an opportunity. Radical collaboration. My homeboy from Arkansas, he tells you what those things are. I don't have to talk about them all, but the one I want to talk about is the one that my mother talked to me about quite often, is the word listen. And she says it has the same letters as the word silent in it. Radical collaboration, bringing everybody into nature requires us to do a lot of things, but listening is one of the major ones. We have to swing high to address all these conservation issues. Focus on the extraordinary results. Sometimes it's that one thing that will make the big difference. And that's from Keller Williams, the one who, uh, he's written this book that's called The One Thing, one of my favorite books that I recently read. Look at the one thing. Don't get overwhelmed by trying to do everything that's important. And then here's one. These are all things that we should consider in our ways when we're trying to reach out to communities of colors and not just to each other. He talks about avoiding those four C's, criticizing, complaining, negatively competing, and negatively comparing. It's important for us to do that. This was a hard one for me. When I first got in the conservation movement, when I first started working at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I continued to compare myself to others. And what I learned from that, Dr. Covey says, either you are bring yourself up or bring yourself down, bringing someone else down or putting them up. And so we have to be careful about that. Climate change. This is one that we know all these things that are going on and why it's important for us to really work hard to bring everyone into the movement. And what I've noticed in most of the work that I've had a chance to do throughout the country, these are the issues that really resonates 
with my cousin Marcus in Chicago. He gets it. When I started talking about less habitat for this one, our riparian corridors that do this, cousin Marcus said, maybe I don't know what you're talking about, but when I tell him we're gonna have higher temperatures and more fires in California, he understands that. And he asked me, what are we doing this year for Earth Day? And so we have to figure out how do we connect with people and bring it up to their level where they can truly understand what we're talking about. Keep going and growing. Being those champions of change is what we want to do. Doing what Susie Orman talks about, doing what is right and not what is hard. And having that reality check is not always going to work, but we need to be reflective and look back on it. I've had a chance to do a lot of work, not just in the United States, but recently in other countries. And it's been really interesting to hear their perspective and how they have worked to engage others in communities. Had a chance to work in Lesotho, Botswana, and Southern Africa on many projects. Had a chance to bring people to our country so they can learn about sustainable fisheries in our country. And this is a group from Turkey that I work with. I left Minneapolis and moved to Atlanta, Georgia. Finally made it where? South. South. It was here that I realized that it was really important to work with kids, encouraging youth to get out there and enjoy nature. And so I really enjoyed that. But it was one day I had moved uh, several times, moved from Atlanta here to DC to be the chief of staff of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And then I had come to uh, Massachusetts and lived there for five years, 135 years after the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service was formed that we had a chance to have our first woman of color or any woman to head up the 13 Northeastern regions. And that was a wonderful job, but I wanted to keep heading back south, so I came back here to work. It was here that I realized that my whole life I had spent working and didn't have that balance in my life. If there's anything that you can learn from this talk tonight is how important it is to take care of what's at the top. And what's up there at the top? Family, friends, community, work. And for me, I put what is important to me. This was a hard lesson for me. And sometimes connecting people to nature, people of color, communities, it may not be easy but we need to figure out how to make it balance. The reason it was hard for me is because I had just been told that I was gonna get the Presidential Rank Award. I had been on C-SPAN that day, and I was on my way home. I called my husband on the phone, and I said to him, guess what happened to me today? Got ready to tell him the story, and he said, no, Mamie, we need to talk. Anytime they tell you you need to talk, usually you're in trouble. I got home, we sat down and talked. He wanted a divorce. He said that my life was not balanced. He was not important in my life. I tell women this in particular because we have a tendency uh, to overwork a lot and not pay attention to home. He wanted a divorce because he said I was married to my job. And so it was here that I had to make a decision, but it was too late because he had decided he was going to move out. But in those three months that he was out, we got some counseling. And it was through that counseling that I realized that balance is important. It's also important for us to figure out when we talk about connecting people of color to nature, we need to take all of these factors in consideration. We may have to do it through families. It might be through communities. It may be through work. It may be through friends that are doing great things. And it might be faith-based in nature. So he came back home. And while he was there, I learned a lot about myself. But I also learned a lot about living. And I learned a lot about dying. My husband came back home for two years. We traveled the world. We did a lot of great things together. And then he came back to me two years later. And he said, I'm leaving you again. And this time I was like, Gloria again. And when she said, go, go out the door, don't turn around now, because you're not welcome anymore. 
But this time, my husband was leaving because he was dying. At the age of 50, he had stomach cancer and was about to die. But it was in his dying that I learned about living because I realized that I had chosen the right community to support me. I learned that giving is something that's hard, but it pays off in the end. Those sacrifices made in going to Wisconsin and Minnesota and all those places, it was those individuals because on his dying bed, he said he wanted every day to feel like Christmas. So for four months he lived and he wanted people in the house with us and he wanted us to have dinner and sit around the dinner table. 37 people came to live with us. They fed us. They took care of us. This is what the conservation community is all about. And when he died on his dying bed, he told me how important it was to keep going and growing. And so as we look at nature for all and all that it's about, we have to remember this is why we do it and this is why I do it because I believe in what he said, the importance of radical collaboration working together, pays off in the end, doing the hard work, avoiding those four cancers of life, and to keep going and growing. It was in his dying bed that he said a poem with me, and it was a song, and it said something that I think is important when we talk about nature for all. It says, each day I live, I live to be, a day to give the best of me. I'm only one, but not alone. Our finest day is yet unknown. Nature for all, we have to think and be optimistic and believe that our finest day is not done. It's not here yet, it's important. That was 10 years ago that my husband passed away. I met me a new boo boo. How you say it? Girls back there is the bay boo or whatever. <laughs> my new hot love. about four years ago and we uh, were engaged in in October and about to be married soon but it was <laughs> thank you but it was his words that now I'll say how important it is when we talk about nature to for all how important it is for us to realize that we have the power we have the inspiration and we can give the encouragement. We can pass the pie when it comes to nature for all. Thank you so much. I am done now. I appreciate your time and your attention. Thank you. Well, here's a couple of questions that I got here, Dr. Parker, that I'd love to pose to you. Um, and one, is, this first one is an interesting one. What, and I think we may have heard some of this just now, but I'd, what is your vision? for a diverse, inclusive, equitable, and just environmental and conservation field? What would it take to get there? So I dream of a world where in the conservation community, again, we're not saying we got to do it, but it's something that we embrace and want to do, and that we look for uh, the benefits of it and not see it as something tiring, but some, something that's going to be exciting about it. I look at an example of that tonight uh, when I said, where's the music? You know, I said, we like music. Let's put some music on. So something as simple as that. I dream of a world where, where people know that when people of color come into the movement, come into the conservation community, that there's going to be actual value added and that any of the resources that we have and that we commit to the effort, that they're actually resources that are well worth the investment. My mother, when I was fishing and I talked about, she's saying no deposit, no return, that's gonna be so, such a great investment when we see that. I dream of kids, kindergarten through 12th grade, having not just seen teachers in their classrooms that talk about the environment, but seeing teachers of color seeing mentors of color, seeing role models that are there for them. I see teachers feeling that they have made the right investment in the kids 
in college. I see environmental education programs in many of the schools that don't have them now. Uh, in, on boards, I cannot wait. There's no pleasure in saying you're the first anything because that's not successful in my considered opinion. It's successful when there are many more of us there. So I dream of a world where there are boards because that's when many of the decisions are made and that's where the resources are committed. House people of color there from a variety of organizations and not just in the environmental world but in other communities as well. That is a beautiful dream and I think it's a dream that's well worth making reality. <coughs> uh, here's one, uh, I think more of an individual question from somebody. What can an, an individual do <coughs> to help encourage c communities to experience the outdoors and to help make nature more accessible to everyone? Well, I think one of the ways that we can encourage others is for people to see others that are there and also really dispel the myth of fear and make them feel a lot more comfortable when they're in the outdoors. Um, for, for me, it wasn't easy being outdoors by myself in the South. In fact, I was encouraged not to go out there a lot by myself. And, and there were reasons for, for women and minorities to be outside. Um, so having people understand um, the fact that, uh, you know, that we have to, again, I talked about it earlier, overcoming that fear um, so showing people that are outside already and that it's okay and that it's a positive experience when they, when they get there. The music industry, the rappers, having them talk about the environment. I love it when I hear Black Eyed Peas and they're singing about the outdoors. I love it when I hear The Weeknd talking about it or the hip hop caucus talking about how important it is to really protect ourselves from pollution. Those types of things are important. So I think finding other uh, people in other industries that can, can share that message with people uh, of color to let them know that it's okay and there's a reason why we need to be the one that are fighting for that. Well, keeping it on the, on the personal level for a moment, this, uh, this question from the audience, what's been your biggest struggle in the workforce as a woman of color, and how did you overcome this? I think one of the bigger struggles for me was certainly always feeling that I had to validate my presence. Whether or not it was someone else making me feel that way or me feeling that way myself. Uh, the inner child in me always felt like I didn't belong. And so understanding that and then overcoming it when it actually happened. I remember my first job in Washington when I went in, in there to be the chief of staff in, of, of in the Fish and Wildlife Service. And it was two things that happened that was really, really amazing to me. Number one, uh, the janitors kept coming into the office, peeping in there, and I kept saying, what, what's going on here? So finally, I said, am I the freak of the week or what? And they said to me, no, this one lady, she said, I've been in this building for 40 years. And she said, I've never seen a person of color in this room except to empty this waste can. And she said, and so there's a sense of pride here to see you in that place. And I think that happens a lot. Uh, it was these ladies, too, that came to my rescue one day when I was in the bathroom crying. And I was crying because I had had one of those experiences where I got tired of being the one that explained to people all of the time that I was supposed to be there. I walked in my office and the lawyer came in and there were three of us standing there. And she said to the first one, hello, Mamie, welcome. We're so happy to have you. And that was my secretary, and she said, no, I'm not Mamie. She said, uh, but I'm happy to be here. She had come with me from my last job. So then she turned to the biologist, and she said, hi, Mamie. And the biologist played along with it, and she's like, I'm not Mamie, but I'm not going to tell you which one is Mamie. <laughs> she played with her. 
So then she went to the third person, and by then she had turned really, really embarrassed by the fact that there was, in her mind, there was an assumption that all of these other ladies were the ones that was actually there as the chief of staff and not me, because it was so unusual to see someone in a position like that. Now, I helped her feel more comfortable about that by telling her that the good news is that some way after 20 years of working for Fish and Wildlife Service, I was not known as the black Mamie Parker. <laughs> so that was really good too. So yeah, so you know, those kinds of experiences of really feeling not that I don't belong. And again, I don't say they all because of someone else. Sometimes they were because of my own feelings. And that's when I was appreciative of some of the men in my life, some of the white men in my life that said, you belong here, you're going to be here, and we're going to make sure that you do well here. Well, uh, let me follow on to that, too, because there's a very good question that someone has written here <coughs> on this subject, but from the other perspective. How do you handle, how do you cope with the responsibility of bringing fellow people of color upward with you? I don't see it as coping. I see it as Mary McLeod Bethune said, lift as we climb. It's a responsibility to pay it forward. It's not uh, something that I view as something negative, but something positive, something that must be done. I'm very careful I don't bring everybody along with me. They need to have their act together and they need to make sure, <laughs> <laughs> they, make, they need to make sure I have my act together, right? So um, you have your act. <laughs> so we've got a unanimous decision on that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So so um, I see it as a responsibility um, for sure, but I don't see it as a burden. I see it as an opportunity to expose people that are doing really well to come in and do great things. The challenge is to find people that really want to do it. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge right there. Is people that have a choice to go in somewhere and be comfortable where they are in their environment or to come to be a pioneer. A pioneer is a very lonesome place to be, right? It's very lonesome, no matter where you are. If you think about the Western movies and the pioneers, it was very lonesome. So to have people willing to make that sacrifice has been a challenge. Well, there is that saying too, that they're usually the ones with the arrows in their butt. And that's, <laughs> that's a good point. Maybe it's their back. I don't know. <laughs> Somewhere back there. Well, speaking of <laughs> <laughs> right, speaking of pioneers, um, uh, and I think I know the source of this one. Where should young women of color look for inspiration in the conservation community, or otherwise? Well, I think that young women, and women too, are finally figuring out that we need our own caucuses, and there's nothing like an affinity group. So it's finding and sometimes creating affinity groups where we can be in a safe place where there are other women that are there. It's about going to places that you wouldn't think that you can get people to support you. And as I mentioned earlier, the janitors in that building, I ate a mini meal with them sitting down and getting the encouragement I, I need. So that encouragement may not always come from the environmental community but it needs to come from a place and from a group of people that really have the heart and the desires to help you. Um, they are now creating affinity groups in organizations. Uh, we need to find them. Uh, some of them are online. Look for those women in conservation. Usually there are subgroups of those that would be people of color there. The Af Outdoor Afro Organization, I think, is a good one that uh, people are now talking about uh, that's really trying hard to work uh, with, with uh, women of color, all people of color, to get outdoors. So finding those organizations that are already established and looking for others to establish yourselves, I think that's important. Uh, bringing people together so that we have the more, more strength to accomplish what we need to do. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, here in Baltimore, in our urban community, there's a lot of trash and more. So people who don't care or don't know the harm it's doing to the environment and the way a community appears. 
what do you think could possibly be the root to that issue so that we can resolve it? Well, I think that the root is certainly a habit and also accountability. A habit in that we don't know any better. If you know better, mama said you do better, right? And in many cases, they don't know any better. Um, they don't know the source of that. They don't know, in many cases, what that means for the environment. But more importantly, they don't know how to connect that back to themselves. And I think that if we could figure out a way to continue, because you all are doing a lot of that in this community when you're talking about, I look at when I drink water or when I use the bathroom and I see where that water is going. I have a proud moment when I even see that in Northern Virginia too, you know, where it talks about this is headed to the bay. So more outreach is important. Unfortunately, we don't have the resources to do it. We need to make that a priority as we're making other conservation issues a priority. That's usually at the bottom of the list when, it talk, when we talk about urban communities. I happen to serve as a commissioner. Uh, the governor just appointed me as a commissioner of the Virginia Game and Inland Fisheries. And when we talk about resources, the last thing that we talk about are resources for outreach. Um, on the Nature Conservancy, on their board, the Virginia chapter, there's a tug of war. When we talk about environmental outreach and education, they talk about what about these pristine areas that we'd like to preserve so that we can be out there by ourselves. So figure, <laughs> figuring out how to make this a priority is, I think, is important. Well, here's one that's a, this is a tough one, but I think it's one we should, we should ask. <clears throat> what would you say to an environmental, to the environmental justice community tired of fighting and advocating for their rights just to live in their community when there seems to be no hope? Well, I would say look on others and be renewed and inspired. I can imagine that Rosa Parks was tired. When I read Lincoln's story, I know he was tired. When I think about MLK and I see in the museums where he walked and his shoes were all worn and my family just had our family reunion in um, Alabama and we watched, walked across that bridge and I think about would I have done that? I know that they were tired but I say in the environmental justice community we can't give up, we just can't stop. And what I learned, I read a lot of books about successful people, and John Maxwell has a book that talks about the 15 things that successful people do. And what he says in that book, he says most of those people that are successful, it was like the last five days that whatever they were doing, they were able to overcome. The last five days before they were ready to quit that they were able to overcome whatever they were dealing with to push them to the top. And so I just like to say, you know, while we all get tired, take a break and rest, particularly think about your family and others. But I just, I just encourage them not to quit. And sometimes it's, um, it's really hard because you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And I know that might be difficult, but usually when that happens to me, there's one individual that will come up to me and say to me, you know, you inspired me. 15 years ago, there's a gentleman in the audience that just told me that from Maryland DNR, Mr. Rogers. 15 years ago, it was something that I said, and that inspires me to get in my car tonight and drive to Penn State. <laughs> so I say, keep, keep going and keep growing, even though it's tiresome sometimes. That's beautifully said. I, I, I think you're so right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, here's one that's inevitable, um, because it, but it's not politics. It's just straightforward question here. What is your perspective and strategy for dealing with the current administration's focus on budget cuts to natural resource agencies? Well, I've had that experience working. Um, actually, I worked for five five different directors, directly for five different directors of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they were from different political persuasions. And what I realized is that in many cases, 
I repackaged those ideas that I had and just changed them a little bit. For example, working with farmers in um, Missouri, you, we changed that and called that cooperative co conservation. But basically it was the Partners for Fish and Wildlife, the private land program where we were restoring wetlands. So figuring out a way to repackage many of our ideas seemed to work. What I also learned is I got alienated from one administration in particular because I really had a problem with mountaintop mining in West Virginia. And it was just hard for me to go out there and see them cutting the tops of the mountains off and all of the sediments running down into streams. And that was hard, John. And so I spoke my piece and I got kicked out of the room. And so sometimes you have to say, fight your best fight, try to win. But if you don't win that one, get back in the ring and try to fight it again, you know, and just keep fighting. So I'm going to win some and you're going to lose some. It's frustrating to see some of the things that I've seen already with NEPA, how they're really uh, trying very hard to really reduce all of the regulations that have been put in place to protect the environment. Uh, it's hard to uh, really understand how we can continue to um, not have leaders in positions that can really make decisions. Um, how it's hard for me to see my fellow um, colleagues at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and other places, and their morale is awfully low at this time. It's really, really hard to watch them and knowing that, you know, that life is tough for them. But what I do know is that things uh, come and they go. And sometimes you need to be in the game and stay in the game. And over time, you know, you'll have your chance. And other times, you just have to grit your teeth and keep on moving. I don't think we could end it on a better note than that. <laughs> I think uh, I will tell a very brief story of my own. <clears throat> I had the good fortune to go to Egypt just a few months ago. <clears throat> we stayed with an Egyptian family there. Mm -hmm. And they were really smart people, good, wonderful people. And, uh, and you know, at a certain point, we got to talking about politics. And I said to our Egyptian host, you know, well, we're, you know, we're, we, f we feel bad about some of the steps our, our country has been taking towards Muslim people and, you know, some of the uh, exclusionary, you know, behaviors and all the changes going on in the immigration policies and, you know, I apologize. And he said, mm -hmm. well, you don't need to apologize. He said, your system is solid enough that you can outlive bad leaders. Mm. He said, we've been dealing with this stuff for 3,000 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and he said, and the last guy was in for 30 years. So he said, show a little backbone. These things do change, and they do change for the better. And it was encouraging to hear that from a person from a country that has not had an easy time and went through the... Arab Spring and mm -hmm. started it there and dealt with, you know, Mubarak, who was uh, not probably the best leader they ever had. And yeah. Well, I think about it in this country, what's positive about it? And I've been called Pollyanna. But I think about when we talk about the black women and how they've really shown what they can do in an election in Alabama and what they've done. <laughs> right. <laughs> what... What they've done in Virginia to come out and get people to vote. So if you think about sometimes it takes us to go down again, like I said, you go to Madison and back up to Green Bay. You know, you have to go down to get back up. And so um, I'm inspired by that. And that's the group of women, too, that really has helped me embrace conservation into the, the African-American community, the black women's agenda. There's a group of 100,000 women. And they meet a large group of them doing the Black Caucus every year. And now we have them uh, doing workshops for girls. And they are wild STEM workshops where they were talking about STEM. And we came in and we said, let's do some wild STEM. So we bring in wildlife. <laughs> we bring in all types of animals into uh, the Hilton Hotel. And these ladies. <laughs> 
these ladies, they come in there with their jewelry on and their mink coats and all of that, but they seem to really enjoy um, seeing uh, conservation and, and having some awareness of, of how they can do better. We do simple things like give them the five things that they can do to help when brushing their teeth, you know, turn the water off when you're brushing, things like that that have really been helpful. So I'm encouraged. I, I'm really saddened by a lot that's going on in this country. It's really divided, and that bothers me. I haven't seen a lot of what I've seen since I left Arkansas in, you know, in the 1980s. Um, but um, again, it's, it's a certain group of the people that are rising up that's inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. Well, I like among the many things you you, you said tonight, I, I loved your uh, your your way of taking apart the word fear, false evidence appearing real. It's and and there's the key. Um, the last question here was, would you please be a speaker for our program? And this person <laughs> lists their phone number for you. Dr. <laughs> so I'll give you that one. <laughs> Join me in thanking Dr. <laughs> Mamie Parker for a fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>